Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood and the soul? The bridegroom cometh, will your robes be white? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Will your souls be ready for the mansion bride? Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul, cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless, are they white as Aside the garments that are stained with sin, washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? sing and turn over to page 55 page 55 at the cross we got my um, mom doing a great job and little judah helping her out on the piano Amen. alas and did my savior bleed and did my sovereign die would he Devote that sacred head for such a worm as I am in. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Was it for crimes that I? my 
inside and now I am happy all the day. Brother Jones, would you please pray for the service this morning? Amen. 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 That we might set our, our affections upon the Lord Jesus yes. Christ and love him and our Father and, and, and want to serve him and see his ministry. Amen. The ministry of the gospel of the church to go forward in the power of God in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. You may be seated. Not too many. Amen, Judah. That's good. I like it. He's, he's getting involved. He's playing piano. He's saying amen. That's a good being raised right, right there. Amen. We just got a few announcements this morning to give. Of course, Pastor, he, you don't see him here. You don't hear him, so you know he's not here. And he's, it's just a joke. It's just a joke. Um, he is oh, down in Florida. He's preaching at Brother Jim McGahee's and this morning and Brother Jimbo Powell's tonight. And he's down there. And like a lot of us here, he's got that cold. And he says, he's just praying that God gets him through it. And uh, gets through today and preach and gives him the power. So keep him in your prayers. Him and Miss Connie, they'll be traveling up to Gatlinburg tomorrow for their actual vacation part. And then he'll be home Thursday night. So pray for their travels, that God would protect them, help them to get over that cold up. Pray for all those. Uh, you can tell by my voice that I'm dealing with it too. No complaints, just it's just not fun. But uh, just pray that we get rid of these, this sickness here. And, uh, of course, we have our... Harvest party this Saturday. As I said in Sunday school, can't believe it's going to be November this weekend already. And our harvest party is November the 3rd this Saturday at 5 p.m. at Brother and Mrs. Uh, Watkins' house. That's my dad and my mom's house, 1490 Old 122 Road, Lebanon, Ohio, 45036. And we need people still to sign up. Um, we have people that signed up to make chili and to make cookies. That's good. We need some more. But as I mentioned in Sunday school, uh, this is a great thing to sign up for that I would if I was allowed. And that's we need judges. We need at least four people to sign up to judge the chili. And so people that are experts in food and, and have great palates need to sign up and taste the chili and decide who the winner is. So we have those sign-up sheets on this table over here. So please, before you run out the door, check those and get involved. It'll be fun. We have, I know um, my wife's worked on a, the decorations and games for everybody, not just kids, but games for kids, games for adults. It'll be a lot of fun just to fellowship and have a good time this Saturday, November 3rd. Other than that, I don't have any announcements. We won't have youth choir tonight. We won't have ladies ensemble tonight. So that's really that's really all we got. So let's do this. Let's get our song books back out and turn to page 506. 506, one of my favorite songs here this morning, Blessed Assurance. 506, let's stand. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God.
singing good songs this morning. We'll have Brother Watkins pray for the offering. Amen. Amen.
took my sins and my sorrows he made them his very own he bore my burden to calvary and suffered and died alone when with the ransom in glory his face I at last shall see twill be my joy through the ages to sing of his love is to us. Hearing that music, hearing Brother Jones' prayer, almost like he read my message before, before I got up here, before, before I preached it. Talked about setting our affections on things above and loving Him more and knowing Him more and just hearing more about Jesus Christ and then to sing about that song, I mean, that's something special and God's just been so good to us. God's been so good to how much He loves us and cares for us. And uh, today's message isn't going to be real complicated. It's going to be real easy, but it's, it's something Christ told us to do, something He commanded us. And so it's important. And He made it simple to understand. And so we're going to start off in turning to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Timothy 6, and I want you, when you get to 1 Timothy 6, I want you to grab John chapter 17. John chapter 17. We're going to start in 1 Timothy 6 and go to John chapter 17. So once again, I want you to get John 17, hold your spot in John 17, and turn over to 1 Timothy 6, and that's where we'll be reading. And before we get started, we'll have a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for... Uh, God, our church, thank you for the people here that are servants to you, God, and servants to each other, and people that love the Lord, and so, so encouraging, Lord, that when you get up to sing, and you sing the congregation, that the, you look out and see people who are, uh, Lord, getting blessed by the words. And God, it's not just another hymn out of the hymn book. It's not just another Sunday morning service, but you see folks that are... Oh, Lord, worshiping you, just singing a hymn that we sung hundreds of times, and they're worshiping God. And, Lord, it's so good to have that. It's so good to see that and have that kind of spirit in our church. And, Lord, today I just want to be a blessing to our people, God. 
and I want you to use me as your vessel. And I'm just so thankful for our church, and I just pray that you'd be in the service this morning, not just in it, but Lord, in the, in the preaching, in the message, and in our hearts, stirring us, moving us. Uh, Lord, that we might desire to know you more, to know you and to glorify you, because that's why we're here, God. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So in 1 Timothy chapter 6, you have your spot there in John 17. In 1 Timothy 6, Paul gives instructions to his, his protege, if you will, his, his young preacher boy, Timothy. And that's what First and 2 Timothy are mainly about as his instructions to this man of God of, of how, you know, the famous chapter on on preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. He's giving directions, commandments, instructions to this young man. And he says, this is the famous chapter where it says, the, the love of money is the root of all evil. But with godliness with contentment, but godliness with contentment is great gain. And he didn't say money was the root of all evil. He said the love of money. And it's true in our lives, we, we really aren't content in a lot of areas of our lives, especially when it comes to money and things like that, we're not content with the prosperity of last year. We want, you know, to, to earn this year and we want to make more money this year. And, and that's just how we are. And it's not a terrible thing. We should be working hard. We should be trying to provide for our families and giving and all those things. And, and money is a part of that. But he said the love of that is the root of all evil. And we're never content a lot of times with a lot of things. You think about how silly we are, how consumed we get with things like sports. And a lot of you are thinking, oh, I don't care. But some people get so consumed. And you know, we're never content with what our team did last year. It wasn't long ago Ohio State upset Alabama and won the champion. They were champions. They were not supposed to win, and they won. But you know what? we're upset this year that they stink this year. You say, they don't stink, they're 7-1. and one. No, they stink. They should have been better. They should have beat that last team. They didn't. And we're not content with why the, the fact that they were champions just two, three years ago. We want them to be champions this year. Amen, Steve. That's right. OH. No I-O? Wow. There's one. All right. But Paul is telling Timothy, don't be worried about these things. And, I mean, it's all throughout the Bible. Christ told his disciples don't be concerned about what you eat and what you wear, but, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these other things will be added to you. But Paul tells Timothy something in this chapter that he wants him to do amongst many other things. And uh, jump down there in verse number 11. But thou, O man of God, flee these things. Talking about what he said previously, the love of money, all that stuff. Flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, Love, patience, meekness, fight the good fight of faith. And here's the phrase, lay hold on eternal life. Learn to thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Now, to the common believer, that might be a weird phrase for you. He told Timothy, who is a saved man, to lay hold on eternal life. And when you think about that phrase, you think, well, I always understood that when we got saved, we don't keep ourselves saved. God keeps us saved, and that's right, amen. That when we got saved, we're not holding on to Jesus, but he holds to us, amen. That our salvation is sealed to the day of redemption. It's not something we have to earn. It's not something we have to keep. It's not something that day in and day out we have to, we have to work to have. In fact, it's a free gift in verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And Timothy, being a saved man, being called to preach the gospel, uh, uh, Paul is telling him, I want you to lay hold on eternal life. And if I ask some, somebody in here today, what does that mean? You might, they might be like, uh, yeah, I don't know. Lay hold on it. I thought he was holding on to me. Why is he telling me to, to lay hold on eternal life? See, in John chapter 17, Jesus tells us what that means. You see, when we got saved, we didn't have to do any work. We repented, which is not a work. We saw the truth, and by repentance, we accepted the truth in front of us. The work 
involved is when you reject the truth. It's like, well, the sky is blue. No, it's not. It's brown. And you go out and it's blue. You can accept the truth that the sky is blue or you could say, no, it's brown. The work is in rejecting the truth right in front of your eyes. But it's not a work to just see the truth and accept it. We repented. We got saved. But then that, that did so many things. I mean, it washed us of our sins. It took our home in heaven. Now we have a home in heaven and there's a mansion there being prepared for us. And there's eternal life. And eternity, what is, what is that essentially, being, having eternal life, being in heaven? That's when we're with him. And our faith that we had in things not seen is now sight. And now we see him in heaven. And we're around the throne. And we can worship him. And we can know him. Unlike we couldn't know him when we were down here. And look at what Jesus Christ said in John chapter 17, verses 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven. One preacher said that when they, you know, the Catholics call the Lord's Prayer when he was instructing the disciples on how to pray, that really is the disciples' prayer. Because he's telling the disciples, this is after the manner you'll pray like this. But in John 17, 1, this is where Jesus is lifting his eyes. And he, this is the Lord's Prayer. He lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son that thy son also may glorify thee. And that's the reason why you're here today. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive honor and glory. For thou hast created all things and were created. We're to glorify Jesus Christ. That's, that's the reason for existing right now when we're in this church is to glorify Jesus Christ. And he's lifting up his eyes to God and saying, the hour has come, glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. And then he says in verse 2, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Remember our Sunday school lesson for the adults. The things Jesus knew that he had all power in his hands. And in here verse 2 he says, Thou hast given him power over all flesh that he should give eternal, what's the eternal life? To as many as thou hast given him. And look, when God defines something, that's the definition. I mean, we can look in a dictionary and in different places to define words. But when God just defines something, you can take that as that's really what that means. In verse 3 it says, Jesus... The Son of God, God manifest in the flesh, says, and this is life eternal. He says, this is what it is, guys. That they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Jesus is looking at his disciples. He's praying to heaven. And his disciples are there. And he's saying, God... Glorify thy son, that thy son may also glorify thee. Power over all flesh, that uh, he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal. That they might know thee, the only true God. And Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Now, that bears us the question this morning. Do you know him? You say, yes, I know him. because That's right. And when you got saved, God, gift you the, God gave you the free gift of eternal life. He washed you of your sins. He forgave you. You're justified. You ha have his righteousness given to you. you. It's imputed unto you. You have a home in heaven and you have eternal life. But that's not where your Christian life stops. We are to know him more every single day. We come to church, why? To know a little bit more about him. We, we, we come here and we read our Bible and we have devotion with God and we hear the preacher preach and we come to Sunday school and we come to church. Why? So that we can know him a little bit more. Amen. And that's the whole reason why we are here is to fellowship with God, to know him and to glorify him. Amen. You see, a lot, of, a lot of modern day Christianity is is the reason for your existence is to win souls, win souls, win souls. And so what everybody does is they, they, they years is they won souls and won souls and won souls, and that's a good thing. But that's not Christianity. It's a good thing to go out and tell others and bring them in and tell them about Christ and get them saved. But if all you're doing is just trying to add people and they don't get discipled and learn to know God, they're not going to last. 
in church. What happens? You get people saved, they come to church, and they're there for a week, and then you never see them again. Yeah, we should win souls. Uh, he that wins souls is wise. Don't, don't be one of those opposite guys on the opposite end of the spectrum. Well, the Bible doesn't command us to win souls. No, that's foolish. That's not what the Bible says. He that wins souls is wise. So he that doesn't try to win souls. What is the guy, not only the guy that doesn't try to win souls, but the guy that criticizes people who do win souls? That's kind of a long distance. It's a good thing. I want to clarify that before I go on. But that's not why you exist. You exist to know him, to glorify him. He says, I have, verse 4, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Jesus said that glory I had with you, God, before the earth was ever created. Hey, that kind of sounds like Jesus was there with God before creation. That he's not just a created man. He's not just some guy that lived, but he was actually eternal. And there before everything. And now in this chapter, he shows the disciples in this prayer and what he says on how to know God. How to know him. How to know Jesus Christ more and more every day. But before we get into the verses and the things that he actually said, can I say the first point to this message on knowing him, on laying hold on eternal life, is you have to be, you have to be a disciple. You have to be a disciple. You see, as I mentioned in Sunday school this morning, in John, we're in the book of John, right? And in John chapter 12 to, verse, to chapter 18, Christ ministry with his disciples. And at the end of chapter 11 in John, it says he walked no more openly amongst the multitudes and the Pharisees, Sadducees and scribes and doctors of the law and all the chief priests. No, this was just between him and his disciples. These, these words and these lessons and these things that he taught them was just between him and them. And to put it in even further context, in chapter 17, Judas is already gone. So only his true disciples are there right now. And so to know Jesus Christ more, you've got to, first of all, be a true disciple of Christ. That word, disciple, meaning a follower of Christ, one of his. It's not the same as apostle. We aren't apostles today, but we are disciples today. Amen? And in order to know Christ, you've got to know him. You have to be saved. If you're not saved, none of this message really matters to you at all. Except for these words that I'm telling you, you need to get saved. You need to know him. You need to take that first step in knowing Christ. Because it doesn't matter what you do or how you live your life. None of those things will matter about laying hold on eternal life because you don't have it to begin with. You've got to be a disciple. You've got to be one of his. Salvation quickens you. That word quicken means to make alive. When you got saved God took something dead. You said, no, I was like, no, your spirit was dead. You were dead in trespasses and sin. And when God saved you, he quickened you and made you alive. And now you have fellowship with the Father. And now you have, the word can enlighten you now in your soul. And you can know him. But if you don't have that spirit that bears witness, if the, the word of God doesn't bear witness to you, if, you don't, if you're not quickened, you can't know him. You got to be a disciple first. But you know the second thing, this is, this is real deep now, the second thing that helps us know him is by his word. Look in verse 6. He says, I have manifested thy name unto the men. Well, there it is. It's not wrong to witness to people. Jesus manifested God's name. Amen. We should do the same. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Verse 8, for I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, that's the words, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didn't send me. Verse number 14, I, and I have given them thy word, and the word and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, but even as I am not of the world. And look in verse number 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. 
verse number 19. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through thy truth. Verse number 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. In this scripture, Jesus tells us that it's his word that is manifested. That's manifested to all those out of the world. It's, that is his word that tells us where Jesus came from. Tells us who he is. In, in verse 14, his word defines separation from the word, from the world. In verses 17 and 19, his word is what sanctifies us. And in verse 20, we believe him and on his things through his word. He's telling us one way to know me, where I came from, how to teach my gospel, how to, how to be clean, how to be separate from the world, how to know where I came from and who I am is by knowing the word of God. And for all of us here, we should have a desire, if we want to know him more, to get in our books and know more about him. Say, we know this. Pastor Drummond preaches on reading our Bible all the time. But if it just comes from Brother Drummond, I mean, he's our pastor, he's, he, he's a shepherd of our flock, but if, if that just comes from him, it doesn't mean a whole lot. If me telling you to read your Bible is just coming from my opinion, it doesn't mean a whole lot. But when Jesus Christ himself made it such an infant on the word of God, that it sanctifies you, that you need to get in it, that, you, that it tells you where he is, and where he came from and who he is, that it helps you believe on him, that it defines your separation from the world, then ought not we to, to, to believe and to want to know more about him by getting in his word? Would we argue that his word is not important? I don't think there's anybody here that would argue that it's not important, that it, anybody that would argue that it's, it's of supreme importance for you to read your Bible. So if there's nobody in here that would argue that that's an important thing for you to do, then let's start doing it. Then let's get in the book and read. Make time for it. Make time for it because what you're doing is not making time to just read some words, even though that's how it can be sometimes. What you're doing is saying, I'm making time to lay hold on eternal life. I'm making time to know my Savior a little bit more today. And that's what, what's great, is sometimes you're reading your Bible and maybe your heart's not right with God and it's just words some days. And sometimes it's dry and it's just not there, but when your heart's right and when that Bible is opened up to you and you're saying, whoa, there he is today. Man. I get to see him a little bit more. I never saw that about him today. I heard it before, but now I'm actually, I'm seeing it. Lately, been in the book of John and the book of Acts in my Bible reading, it's just like, wow, there he is. I get to know him a little bit more, and it brings such joy just to know him. Second thing is to know him, this is real simple. Number three, by prayer. You know how you know him more? By prayer. Look in verse number nine of our text. I pray for them. Wow. So who's he talking about? His disciples. He says, I pray for them. I pray, for, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. He said, I pray for for my disciples. Another passage where he tells Peter, hey, Peter, Satan has desired to sift you as wheat. We studied that this morning in Sunday school about Peter's denial of Christ. But he says, but Peter, what did he say to him? I have prayed for you. In Romans chapter 8, it talks about the spirit bearing witness and... and, and an intercessor for us. And even when we don't know what to pray, he makes that interpretation to God. This is what your child's going through. This is what they're facing today. And this is what's happening. And this is what, even though they don't know how to say it and what to say exactly, the God is, Jesus is making intercession for us and praying for us. And you know, when you pray, you're laying hold on eternal life. After all, also in verse 20, he says, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. It begins in John and all the way through the, new, the rest of the New Testament of Christ being our intercessor and praying. 
He's doing that for you. He's serving you this morning. But you know what a lot of people say nowadays in churches? You know, I don't pray like I should. And maybe that means they pray for three hours, but they feel like they should pray for six. But what if it's, I pray once or twice on Sunday and that's it? Do you want to know God more? Would you that prayer is not a way to know him more? Then why don't we pray a little bit more? Say, if it comes from me, it doesn't mean a whole lot. It's just my opinion. But I don't know when the Bible says, pray without ceasing. When it says men ought always to pray. When he told his disciples later on, just here shortly after he said these things, and they went to the Garden of Gethsemane, and they were, they, he was there praying in great grief and great distress. He walked out and saw his disciples sleeping, and he says, Could you not watch with me one hour? Could you not pray? He says, Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. He said, praying always with all prayer and supplication. Paul said, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Should we pray more? Amen? Let's pray more. Once again, just like our Bible reading, sometimes prayer is just, man, making yourself get on your knees and Take that time, even though you're wanting to go do this and wanting to go to that, and you make yourself pray and wonder, uh, did God even hear that? And it feels like you prayed for everything in the world in 15 minutes, and you went through the whole list, and everything's done, and it's like, well, I guess that's the right, I feel better because I know I did the right thing, but then sometimes you've prayed, and you've prayed, and you've prayed, and all of a sudden, he's there, and he lets you know Hey, I'm, I'm still real. I'm still alive. I still have power to answer your prayer. And you say, oh God, please don't leave. And you want to stay in prayer. Has anybody else ever felt like that? It's not every time. It might take you a while. It might take weeks before you ever feel like God's there with you when you're praying. Just keep praying. Lay hold on eternal life. What does it mean lay hold? You're, you've got it. You're not going to let it go. You know what the other thing is? It's by being his disciple. It's by his word, by his prayer. But also the fourth thing is by suffering. You know what? This is something that you, nobody in here can get away from. Unless God raptures us out of here right now, you know what? We're all going to face storms. We're all going to face trials, tribulations, hard times in our lives. And what one person's trial is, is not another person's. Some people look at other people and say, well, you don't know what I've been through. And uh, that other person, well, you don't know what I've been through. And we, sometimes people get in arguments about who's been through harder stuff. I remember being a kid in school uh, arguing about being more sick than this other kid. And I, and I went home that day and I thought, did I really just try to win an argument that I was more sick than somebody? But the, the truth is, every person faces some kind of tribulation and trial in their life. Christ said in this chapter, verse 14, he says, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them. Jesus there, and in other scriptures, tells the disciples, hey, you're going to be persecuted. The people are going to hate you. And those, by the way, those disciples and apostles and other early Christians face a lot more than me and you face. See, our world is messed up. And when you read the news this past few days, you'd see there are some Christians and, and even people who we would consider not really to be Christians being killed and murdered, right? And the only thing you can say is, wow, our world is messed up. But man, what these disciples faced, Christ said, you're going to face all these things. I talked to the kids in school Thursday about all the things we read the verses in 1 Corinthians where Paul talks about how he was in perils of the sea and perils by his own perils of robbers how he had received stripes how he how he was beaten how he was stoned how he spent a night and a day in the deep and he experienced all these sufferings and yet in that same chapter he says I will rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me 
In verse 18 of our text, he says, As thou hast sent me into the world, even so hath I, have I also sent them into the world. And we're going to experience things in our life that are hard things, that are trials, that are tribulations. Sometimes it's going to be people that face a sickness or disease and God doesn't cure it. And they go on to be with the Lord. And sometimes, you think about in the Bible, when God told, when, when you think about Samson, and he's going to ask God that one last time, God, give me strength. And God gave him that strength. And he pulled down the pillars of that temple and all those, those Philistines died. You think about other times where, where men called out to God. Joshua called out to God, make the sun stand still. And God made it stand still. When Elijah prayed to God to, to heal this, this person that he had stretched himself over and breathed on. Or when Elijah prayed for rain and God rained. And all the times where men prayed in the Bible. And you look at Paul and he's mentioning all these things. And he says, thrice I sought the Lord that he would take this thorn in the flesh away from me. And God looked at Paul. And after saying yes, all those other men, he looked at Paul and said, no. Sometimes you face things and God brings you through it. And sometimes people face things and God doesn't. And you wonder, where's, what's the point of all this? Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it tells us that we might comfort others with the same comfort we received. Amen. But it's also to know him a little bit more. Amen. And God's going to place things in your life. Some things might seem just self-inflicted, like we brought it on ourselves, but sometimes things come on us and it's just like, why, God? And it's down in the valley where you get to know him a little bit better. If we could just turn one more place, Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. There's, not, there's a lot of scriptures we could reference with John chapter 17. Lots of them. But I feel like this one does the best that Paul wrote. He says in verse 7, Philippians 3, verse 7, But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. There's that little thought of being content with everything else, but not being content with knowing him more. Verse 8, Yea, doubtless... And I count all things but loss for the excellency of the what? Knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. For whom I have what? Suffered the loss of all things. And do count them but dung that I may win Christ. Hey, Paul was saved by grace through faith, not of works. But he's still saying everything else in my life is lost and that I, that I might just win Christ. Let me know him a little more. You see, he couldn't lose his salvation, but his life was still to know Jesus Christ more and more. Amen. And it says in verse 9, and be, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him Amen. and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Being made conformable unto his death. If by any main means I might attain, attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I had already attained. Either were already perfect. But I follow after it that I may apprehend. That for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. But, with, but this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. Paul says, I count everything else but loss. I forget those things that are behind. Just forget about it. And I'm reaching for him. Why? Through the fellowship of his sufferings. It's hard to find, you know, you can look at Job. And other men in the Bible, and, and of course Christ, the one who suffered more than all. But as far as, you know, people who tells you what they suffered, there's, there's not many like Paul. He says, I count it worthy. I, I, I'm fellow, the fellowship of his suffering. Why? That I might know him. Yes. Do we want to know him? Yes. You see, 
You may not read your Bible and you may not pray. You might not even be a disciple this morning. You might not even know him in the first step. But one thing is very true that you will have is tribulations and trials. And if you are a Christian this morning, if you have believed on him, those trials, it doesn't mean you have to walk around with a smile on your face saying, it's okay, God's still good. And you don't have to be a fake and a phony about it. But just realize that that's there for you to comfort others, but to know him a little bit more. It was such importance to Paul that he said, I count everything else but dung. If that's how important Paul had it, if that's how much importance Christ placed upon it in John chapter 17, I ask you, are you one of his? How's your walk? How do you treat the trials that God has placed in your life? Do you really know him? If we could have a piano player come this morning and give an invitation tonight, today, this morning, do you know Christ? Do you want to know him more? As I pray and you need to come, I think everybody needs to come because we all need to know him more. Lord, thank you for the word of God. God, Lord, I want to know you more and I want to know more about you. And God, I count not myself to have apprehended. No way, God. No, Lord, not me. <clears throat> but I want to know more. I don't want to be content in my walk with God. I want to, to know more about you, Lord. I want to get in that book more and I want to pray more and I want to seek you more and I want to glorify you, God. Lord, I love you. Thank you for your word and for your goodness. And thank you for your love for us. I pray your will would be done this morning.